Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Super excited to be talking about centrism, nuance, and so much more. We have Will Papper joining us on the show. Hello. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. Super excited for this episode. For those that don't know Will's background, he's a product manager and philosopher focused on how new technologies can help or harm society. You can find the links in the bio below to papper.me as well as the LinkedIn and Twitter profiles. Will, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Thoughts of the direction of our world. So I think we're at this uh, point where we have this debate between are we in a point where we're stagnating or are we in a point of optimism? So some people say, hey, we have self-driving cars coming about. We have um, incredible innovations in uh, computing power. We have machine learning. These are all amazing things that will dramatically change society. And then other people say, we're starting, we've already peaked in our productivity. We're starting to hit this point of decline. Um, Robert Gordon, for example, wrote The Rise and Fall of American Growth. His thesis is that like, since 1970, we've actually been declining in our productivity. Um, and that 1870, 1970 was the peak period of productivity in US history. So it's something where I think people, people's views right now and the state of the world depends on whether you have this optimistic, pessimistic approach, this perspective of like things are changing in great ways or things are leading to stagnation and turmoil. Um, I think that's where a lot of the current divisions in society are coming from. And it does seem as though that the, the disconnection that we have from the ecosystem that sustains us, this planet, how it gives us the air, the water, the food, the resources that we need to live, that the disconnection that we have from that is directly reflected in the society's fabric that we live in, mm -hmm. how dysfunctional some aspects of it are. Do you feel like because of that disconnect to our ecosystems that we live in is a reason of the dysfunctions? Um, Yes, I think that because you have people with two dramatically different worldviews trying to, you have two groups with dramatically different worldviews trying to make decisions on the same things, where if you have an approach of stagnation, your view on, for example, universal basic income will be very different, or your view on global warming will be very different compared to an optimistic approach. And I think that that is where a lot of the crosstalk happens, where like people miss each other's points because they have these different worldviews that they're coming to the table with. And I don't think that's acknowledged enough. Yes, yes. So, okay, so then maybe one of the strategies then would be to unpack people's uh, worldviews in nuance-driven ways and to do it where you can take a complex issue like, uh, like the ecosystems that we live in and how they are being dysfunctional because we're disconnected from them or something like a universal basic skin come to solve some of the wealth mm -hmm. inequality issues that we have. And instead of being extremely polarized on it, how would you recommend people to have a more nuance-driven conversation? Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, the reality is that if any, the thing that I learned from philosophy is that if anything seems simple, you're probably missing a lot. That anything simplified probably is, uh, probably is missing crucial components um, and extreme simplification is not the way to go. So I think that um, if you think you're totally right, you should probably reevaluate um, as kind of my heuristic of these trade-offs are very complex. Um, no one really has the answers to the stagnation versus optimism question, let's say. Um, so that's, that's what I use as my own personal marker for myself, is if I think I'm right, I'm, if I think I'm completely right, if I th can't think of arguments against what I'm saying, I'm probably missing something. Yeah, I love that. That's a really good way of putting it, is that if I can do things like um, take my perspective and also hold simultaneously the most contrasting worldview and, mm -hmm. um, and then be able to uh, see both of those at the same time, uh, then uh, that can be really helpful. And that's a good heuristic too, is to constantly be looking um, for that, uh, um, the opposing side mm -hmm. of the argument and also the, um, uh, the other thing that you mentioned at the beginning, which was, uh, um, Simplification. Sim oh, reductionism. Yes. Yeah. Reductionism. That this is a good one. And I think we're actually going to revisit this later as well. But just reductionism um, can lead us to uh, oversimplification, which then leaves out the nuanced details yeah. of specific subjects. Yeah. Okay, let's get into um, let's get into the trajectory. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're born in Manhattan in New York City. Um, you stayed there until you're 
18 and went to WashU, and then you transferred uh, to Stanford, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you did philosophy there. I want to get into um, your earlier years. Uh, you got interested in entrepreneurship through gaming. Teach us about building the online uh, gaming community. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah, when I was 14, I uh, set up a just online game server with some friends. Um, and it was basically like we were playing Minecraft and doing whatever else we did at 14. Um, and it was just, we just told some friends, they told some friends, and almost entirely via word of mouth, we grew to around 5,000 people. Um, and that was incredible. There's actually, um, literally people uh, met, got married, had kids after meeting on our game server. Whoa. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, whenever people ask for like your fun fact, my favorite fun fact is like, I've indirectly led to like <laughs> people having a child. child um, yeah, yeah. yeah they, they, they met on our server. And being able to have that kind of impact on people's lives was incredible. And being able to just scale something based on word of mouth was incredible too. Um, and I mean, it's, we never set out to create like a giant server. We just set out to create a fun place with our friends. Um, and that kind of made me realize of like, oh, you can do something you enjoy. You can have, make something that impacts people. And you can also, uh, hopefully, well, that didn't make money, but you can also hopefully make enough money off of it to sustain yourself yes. um, or to make it profitable. Um, so I, that, that just showed me, whoa, like a bunch of friends just working together can scale something to 5,000 people and lead to like someone meeting and having a kid. That's, that's incredible, and that got me hooked on technology, entrepreneurship in general. Yeah, you yeah. can have a, a purpose that you find really meaningful and then be able to provide people with value and also um, a being funny to sustain yourself yes. um, over time. And then um, what else what else were some of these things that happened to you along the way up until uh, doing library and AI, helping people find expertise faster with AI and NLP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, back in high school, I had, so I found the online community and then there was a group at the MIT Media Lab that was building a decentralized uh, mesh network for local communities. Um, and they were like, hey, like, we see you. We see you have experience with um, like with building these communities, um, and uh, I also knew how to code Java. They use Java as their programming language. I like coded some Android apps. They used Android, um, so I had gotten in touch with them, and I was able to do research at the Media Lab when I was, I think, 16 at the time, which was an absolutely incredible experience that shaped my worldview. Um, and it was because what we were working on was this technology with pretty incredible potential. Um, the idea was that you could have uh, phones communicate directly with each other, so you didn't need any cell service at all to be able to communicate. Um, that works in stadiums, that works in disaster areas, that works in all sorts of ways. Um, but the privacy trade-offs, for example, are really complex in those technologies. Um, there's all these questions of like, how do you verify identities? Do you want like strongly verified identities? Um, and then people can't like speak can't can't speak anonymously. Yeah. Do you want to allow people to speak anonymously and know that that can come with some some difficulties in building a good community? Um, and that got me really interested in these privacy technologies in the first place. Um, yeah. And uh, blockchain is one example of them. Mesh networking is another. Um, um, I think there's a lot of a lot of potential for these technologies that can do both a ton of good and a ton of harm depending on their, u their use. Um, and that's why I think it's really satisfying to approach them from a philosophical perspective and work on them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. And so that's where you're heading into um, product management and digital authentication. Yes, yeah. And also doing the Kleiner Perkins Product Fellowship. Yes, that's correct. I right. like how you taught me that um, privacy enables the evolution of ideas yes. in society, that yeah. helps society evolve. I think your example with like the LGBTQ community being mm -hmm. able to gather in small private uh, settings right. and grow, I think that's really important. Whereas if you had that um, over, um, that kind of like Orwellian style of, of oversight on people uh, congregating uh, could prevent them from uh, society evolving. In that I sense. think, yeah, I think privacy, fundamentally anything about privacy is a trade-off between privacy and security. And I don't think those are easy answers. Um, uh, you know, like WhatsApp can be used by the LGBT community, can also be used by terrorists. And I think that those are really, really, really hard questions of where do you strike the balance. Um, but fundamentally, I don't, I, don't, I don't know where the balance should lie, but I do believe that 
privacy helps people helps people gather, shift norms slowly. The progress we see in civil rights, a lot of that comes from the ability to uh, hold these like hold these views and attitudes in private and slowly share them with trusted close friends until they become public ideas mm -hmm. um, that are accepted. Um, but the security trade-off is always really, really tough. And different countries take different approaches, different people take different approaches. I don't think they're the right answers, but I think that there's um, definitely important value in both. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, this, this exact, this is super nuanced view on like even something as simple as a messenger app like WhatsApp with um, being able to be used to co congregate people to evolve mm -hmm. societies or to be used to cause harm on, on right. others. Like mesh networking because it never touches a central server. There's no, there's no central logging. So that means that you give people um, communications that can work anywhere. That's a fantastic, fantastic capability to be able to literally communicate with your neighbors without needing to pay for an internet connection, have an internet connection available. But it also offers mostly completely untraceable communication. And is that something you want to, is that something you want to enable? Um, mesh networking community is a good example of that because uh, like logging is really important for solving crimes. Um, do you want to forego that capability? Do you want to find a balance? Do you want to like offer like privacy preserving like central nodes that are uh, that 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 people can opt in or opt out of? Um, but ultimately, transparency in these trade offs is what really matters. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, mm -hmm. the transparency definitely matters a lot when you're kind of born with just into the black box and you don't necessarily know exactly what are the things mm -hmm. that are governing the world that you engage with. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. versus if it's transparent at least, and then you can engage with it, maybe augment it, maybe try and uh, gather in private communities to build things that can obsolete it as right. well. All right. these, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, let's do, uh, okay, this is good. So we're on a, um, on a philosophy edge. So this is cool. You studied Latin when you starting 11. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it's not only essential like history to learn, but it's also uh, beautiful on the poetic mm -hmm. side of things. Now, what is the difference between moral and political philosophy? Yeah, so I see moral, so, so political philosophy is fundamentally a question of how do we organize society? What obligations do governments have to their citizens? Um, what, uh, how should people cooperate with each other? Um, how should we approach equality and inequality? Um, and then moral philosophy in my mind is how do we hold people responsible within those systems? Um, so for example, like should someone, um, should, should someone be held responsible for the actions of their family and friends or um, should, uh, should we not hold people responsible in the case of accidents, let's say? Um, how do we, that's, those are, like, like those, are, those are tricky questions. Like, for example, if you, uh, if you know that someone is doing a bad thing and you don't report it, should we hold that person yeah. responsible for the consequences of those actions? Um, and that also leads to a really interesting concept of moral luck. So mm -hmm. moral luck is, um, is the idea, so let's say there's two people who are driving drunk one person gets into a terrible accident that injures another person. One person drives home just fine. Um, is it fair to evaluate those people based purely on the consequences? They committed the same action. They both chose to drive drunk. Mm. In one case, it led to a bad consequence that harmed others. In another case, it didn't. Um, but moral luck is like, should we, should we punish the Drunk, the, the drunk driver who didn't injure someone less just because it happened to work out okay? Should we punish the other person more for their accident? Um, or should there be a system that prevents the driver from driving in the first place because their blood alcohol content is too high? Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Again, privacy and surveillance questions. Like, yeah, do yeah. we want to prevent drunk drivers at all, give everyone an integrated breathalyzer? Um, yeah, currently, yeah. the approach has been no, even though we have the technology for that. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So. The, I think that, that shows that like moral philosophy, you can't just purely evaluate it based on the consequences. Um, it's tough to say that, uh, that, that someone is less responsibly, responsible because it happened to work out okay. But then if you evaluate based on the actions, that also leads to its own trickiness too, because it's like, let's say for example, someone is doing something reckless, but that's extremely unlikely to lead to something bad. So like, let's say for example, 
you're in a, in, we're in California, let's say someone is, for example, starting a bonfire in like with some friends um, in an area that is prone to wildfires. Do you want to punish every person who has started like mm. a small cooking fire with some friends the same way as someone who sparks an entire wildfire? It, that's, that's, again, that's again a tough question because in that case, it wouldn't seem that, the, uh, that punishing every person for a bonfire um, is appropriate if they didn't spark a huge wildfire. Um, that's where one, it seems that the actions could lead to tremendous consequences, but punishing everyone as if those consequences occurred seems m to most people to be unjust. Um, it's Ooh. like reckless for some people to start a bonfire in a high fire area, but yeah. do you want to punish them as if they've caused massive devastation? Or do they have to have a fire making skill level at 99 before being able to, <laughs> yeah, or like a threshold of like 20 or something. Exactly. But to, that also leads to another interesting question is how do you measure these things too? Yeah, yeah. So it's nice to be able to say like, we should set uh, this bar for blood alcohol content or we should set this bar for like fire safety or gun safety or all these other topics. But how do you, how do you take into account the nuances of different people's approaches. Like, let's say someone's really good at making fires. Um, they have tons of experience handling fires safely, um, but they're also like goofing around with friends and not paying too much attention. That might decrease their skill level to some extent. Do yes, we do right. we do we cut off the threshold at a certain point? We say like, oh, no matter how skilled you are, if you're like gathering with 15 friends and like uh, and like like distracted, then you shouldn't be allowed to start a fire in these areas. It's it's tough to. One thing that philosophy definitely teaches is these, where you draw the lines on definitions is really, really difficult. Um, what is good is like a, 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 a question that has been answered, or asked throughout all of history and yes. never answered. Um, yes. The Greek philosophers, um, Plato and Aristotle in particular, took a pretty good attempt at answering those, but um, no, one, no one has good answers. And right now we've kicked the can down the road. So like utilitarianism, for example, um, is a branch of moral philosophy that- Okay, we're, we're, <laughs> let's, let's hit the ball back on the first subjects okay, and then, we'll get, and then yes, we'll get there. Because yes. there's so much to even unpack just on that thing. I love the yeah. way that, you're, um, that you go through these examples. Um, I think the, um, we're, we're going to have to do more shows on just these examples of centrism and nuance because um, I totally agree with you that when you have an example like um, a, a motor vehicle and um, someone that gets away, it's, you called it uh, moral luck when mm -hmm. someone gets yes. away with driving drunk without killing someone. So the idea is then, um, is there a potential way to get people um, even pre even entering a car that prevents mm -hmm. them from driving, um, that the food maybe gets them to call the Uber or gets them a friend, pick them up or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So all these other um, scenarios to help. And then other ones like even to the fire example, you have one person causes a wildfire, but millions of people make fires before mm -hmm. that that, uh, that go perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. So. Um, how to quantify these things, how to um, yeah. see them in a nuanced way is so, so interesting. And then this, and then this does, yeah, this does kind of, um, uh, also I want to ask, uh, how does psychology influence moral philosophy? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's kind of two branches of moral philosophy. One is like we, eval we should evaluate things purely based on like the appropriate theoretical frameworks. Um, utilitarianism is one, uh, Kant has another moral framework, and they're kind of like removing themselves from from specific situations and just trying to reason about them abstractly. Um, but there's also another branch, which is let's look at the evidence that we have from psychology and use that to influence um, our decision making. There was a professor I had at WashU, uh, John Doris, who writes on this heavily, and he has fantastic, fantastic books on the subject. Um, and the idea there is like, let's look at the best available evidence that we have and try to work from there. Um, some philosophers don't like that because they think like, our psychology is constantly being updated. We like don't have a good understanding yet. There's replication crises. So like, why should we use this evidence when we don't know if this evidence is correct? Um, in my mind, I take the other approach, which is uh, the best data we have available is something we should be using, and we should update it as we get new information. Um, so one example um, that John Doris uh, taught me was on helping behavior, where if, for example, a lawn mower is running and someone drops a stack of books, people are significantly less likely to help them just because there's this annoying noise in the environment. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, if someone finds a dime in the phone booth um, and someone drops books, 
they're significantly more likely to help them. Yes, okay. a dime in a phone booth. And this, these are not Just experiments run a long a time ago. Bit. Like it's well, roughly yeah. the value of a dime that we that we that we have today. Exactly. Um, when these such small things can affect whether we help others. Oh, the coffee one's another one. The, you either give them hot coffee or cold coffee, and yes. then you ask them what their relationship is like with their significant other or their parents or exactly. something. Exactly. And then I think colder coffee makes people feel a little colder about the relationship exactly. versus hot. They're more maybe loving or compassionate. Yeah, or so for example, it's easy to say like we should always help others or we have an obligation to help others. But when the data shows that a lawnmower running makes us less likely to help others, yeah, yeah. are we comfortable making these pronouncements about how people should act which kind when of the environment sense. so heavily influences them? Yes, yeah. which totally makes sense because when you have uh, two humans that are in a quiet setting um, and something occurs, your, your cognitive resources are really only being allocated to just a year yeah. your presence and someone else's presence and helping them in that scenario. Versus when there's so many other things happening in the background, you're kind of like making sure that nothing is um, uh, about to harm you or like something's gonna fall on you or whatever. Like there's so many other things, something could break over here. It's just loud, like yeah. a loud environment with lots of different things going on. You have to like also keep things in your peripheries and whatnot. Yeah, so, so that's a good one. And then I just wanna yeah. also say on, the, on what you were just saying that, um, Depending on so many aspects of psychology, of our mm -hmm. biology, like, yeah, a tumor pressing on the amygdala causing someone to mm -hmm. go and potentially kill someone, things like this, yeah. that there's so many aspects that we have to be aware of and biases yeah. that we have to be aware of in the processes of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, again, this gets back to the central point of nuance, really, which is where... Um, uh, trying to trying to predict how we act or how others act is actually extremely extremely difficult, um, and our understanding of the factors influencing people is currently extremely rough. Um, so incentives, your gut microbiome. There's like so exactly, many things exactly. flying around. Yeah, and we we understand almost none of it. So uh, I think using the best the best assumptions we have right now and working from there is um, the best data available is what we should do. I don't think we should ignore this important, important background um, because, uh, again, if, if, if you think that someone should always act in a certain way, so Kant is famous for saying, like, you should never, ever lie. Um, like, because, like, like, and the example is always like, well, like, let's say someone is like, like, let's say, let's say you, like, hold nuclear launch codes and someone's threatening you and being like, Oh, you need to get. Do you know the launch codes? If so, you need to give them to me. Kant would say you cannot lie and say I don't know the nuclear launch codes. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Trying yeah. to make That's trying to make counter. Yeah, exactly. That are super extreme misses the nuance. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think I think that's why that's why the psychological element is really helpful because it helps us think through some of this additional nuance um, and maybe additional understanding of neuroscience will change our assumptions later on. That's perfectly possible. I think we but, can give another example. I think super relatable to people, which is that like most people have um, maybe like parents that are uh, not necessarily. Um, as uh, potentially it progressively evolved as they are, uh, mm -hmm. as their children are in some respects. And so when their parents maybe ask them a question about one of their like b uh, beliefs or whatnot, if they can rather um, just, you know, kind of like sidestep that, like you're not, maybe you're lying, maybe you're sidestepping, but the point is, is that you can kind of, you're saving time by mm -hmm. not having to go into a subject that you have maybe a dozen times before with them that you mm -hmm. know you're not gonna be able to make any progressive ground on. So you'd rather just go back to like reading or working on what you yeah. care about and hanging out with your friends that care about that same thing. Mm -hmm. So I think there's tons of, of nuance around that point. Yeah, yeah, this like saying hard. something yeah. that's technically correct. They're lying by omission. Like mm -hmm. it, that, those, it's easy for Kant to say to never lie, but if you like, if you if you don't actively lie, but you just choose not to disclose something, is that also lying? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. you could do a lot of you could do a lot of philosophical work to try to figure out if that is, or you could say that we should hold a nuance, more nuanced perspective of like how we view how we view truth and lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, again, another whole uh, we have to we mm -hmm. we, we have to. Uh, yeah. explore these uh, ideas more and these examples of these more. This has so much to do with philosophy, with our, yeah, with our psychology and our biology, mm -hmm. as well as the nuance of centrism. Mm -hmm. 
Let's do um, uh, the best ways to organize society. Yes. Okay, so what are the differences uh, between, and so this is the political philosophy yes. side of things. What are the differences between the utilitarianism, um, Rawlsian liberalism, libertarianism? Yes, so uh, I'll start with utilitarianism first because that was kind of the first theory that came about. So utilitarianism uh, is basically says you should try to maximize net good. Um, Jeremy Bentham was one of the original thinkers on this. Peter Singer is a modern thinker on utilitarianism. Um, and it's basically you should try to maximize like happiness for everyone. So you shouldn't prioritize, say, uh, like, let, like let's say there are uh, three people drowning and you can save two people and they're strangers or you can save uh, one person and they're, your, they're like your, your mother or father. Utilitarianism would say you should try to save, you should save the two people who are strangers instead of the one person who's your parent. Um, and utilitarians then go into all these different thought experiments um, of like, for example, like if there's a doctor who is a serial killer but also is on the way to curing cancer, are they <laughs> saving more lives than they're killing by their, like they're cured of cancer compared to being a serial killer? Like should you let them walk free? So utilitarianism uh, leads to very tough moral trade-offs. Um, that's, that's one issue with it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. The, another one is like, okay, would you potentially do something like um, save uh, five people's lives um, versus save the live, life of someone that's trying to do something like yes. cure cancer? Yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. Like, how can you value someone's impact on the trajectory of, of the world yeah. and providing utility to the world versus five exactly. people that maybe not providing as and much utility? And there's a great book called Strangers Drowning that... Uh, addresses these questions Gosh, correctly. That's um, the name of the book. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very good book on these questions okay. um, and very, very approachable for people who okay, don't have philosophy cool. background. Um, cool, cool. But yeah, so utilitarianism, uh, and then there's the whole question of how do we define net good? Like, mm -hmm. should, you save, should you save a doctor, for example, over someone else? Uh, should you save like uh, children over elderly people because the children will have longer lives? Um, yeah, yeah. So utilitarianism leads to a lot of these tough questions and a lot of people don't have answers. So Rawlsian liberalism kind of came about as an answer to this. So Rawls basically says that um, you should have, um, he, he, he sets out a few obligations to society, but I'll call out like the most important ones. Um, one is that uh, you should have equality of opportunity. Um, basically like you should have the ability to, uh, to, to the ability to not be kept out of things based on like your gender, your race, um, your birth, um, religion, socioeconomic status. Exactly, things, yeah. exactly. Like these things that these things that you can't control and that also don't affect your ability to do a job. Mm -hmm. So like you should have a society where everyone's able to access like important roles in society. Maximal degrees of economic freedom. Yes, and related to that, he also has the idea that um, inequality is justified when it maximizes the position of the people who are the least well off. So mm. for example, um, if someone, if there's a society where like everyone, where, where one person has $100 and everyone else has, uh, everyone else has $2, um, Rawls would say that that's okay if, that, that inequality is okay as long as there's, um, as long as it's the best possible outcome. So for example, let's say like you said that person shouldn't have $100, they should have uh, $50, but that led to everyone else having one, having $1 instead of $2. Rawls would say uh, sure, sure. that, oh, Rawls would say it's better for everyone to have $2 and, and for, for, for this more significant yeah. um, inequality to occur if it maximizes the position of the pe people who are least off. But if there's a world where someone controls, uh, but it, it and that those are those are the really most relevant points of Rawls. And like, Humans flourish when the people that are least well off have the most degrees of economic freedom. Yes, and a closely related idea that he has, um, and this is this is kind of an idea throughout uh, like liberal political thought in general, is like the freedom to pursue one's own projects. Yes. So like people yes. have their own conceptions of what is good. Um, they should be able to do what that is if they want to um, host a podcast interviewing thought leaders. That is a fantastic that is a fantastic thing that they should have the freedom to pursue. If they want to go become philosophers, that's something they should have the freedom to pursue. If they want to even count the blades of grass in a lawn and they think that's the good life, they should have the freedom to pursue that. So um, it essentially allows people to form the projects that they think is best for the world. Um, 
And uh, how do you economically sustain on counting the blades of grass in the lawn? Yeah, 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 yeah. we so, we'll probably get to universal basic yeah, income yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then and then there's libertarianism, and libertarianism uh, says like the obligations of a government are not like are not like the freedom to pursue one's own projects and quality of opportunity, but it is like Robert Nozick's libertarianism is that like government should purely basically purely protect like life and property and that it should be a minimal state beyond that. And there's this interesting question. Rawls thinks that um, you should interfere to create an equal playing field. So ah. someone should not be allowed to discriminate in hiring um, because those jobs should be open to everyone. Well, Nozick thinks that like that's okay because you're restricting the freedom of the person who is doing the hiring. So they have different approaches of who should have which freedoms which is a really, really complicated question. Um, if the person that owns all of the property that is being protected by the government is also doing things like rent seeking on the people that are least yes. well off, like these, there needs to be an intervention to help the people have better degrees of economic exactly. freedom. Yeah, exactly, yeah. so like whose freedom are you preserving is a really important question yes, yes, between yes. those two theories. Um, and oh, one fun little known fact about Nozick. So Nozick actually, so there's a lot of um, talk in the media um, about reparations, reparations for African Americans who are affected by slavery. Um, Nozick actually says that like society must come from a just starting point for this libertarian society to be just. So you must have basically like free and voluntary transfers of property um, from the starting point until now. Uh, slavery was not a free no. and voluntary transfer at all. Um, it was treating people as property, which is incredibly unjust. Um, and, uh, and the interesting thing is that Nozick actually alludes to the fact, he doesn't say that he, uh, he doesn't say explicitly that like reparations should be pursued, but he does say that reparations are important w because these injustices have um, preserved for, uh, to, because these injustices have occurred to have this libertarian society. So like, like, when people talk about like libertarianism in America, it's not Nozick's libertarianism because we haven't had it. We've set, had injustices. We haven't Tons set this equal justice. starting point exactly, yeah, um, yeah. which is really interesting. And I think that also gets lost in a lot of discussion of like. I mean, there's other libertarians who believe that like the starting point we have right now is a just one, but like specifically Nozick's libertarianism would not would not support libertarianism today. We would need to equal the playing field before we can pursue it, which I think makes it a lot more palatable um, yeah, yeah. when compared to Rawlsian liberalism, because the idea of like, if we said right now, like, uh, it's okay to, do, it, it's, it's okay to like, for example, like uh, discriminate based on socioeconomic status, that would be incredibly unjust when which people have been what's told that. Which is what's happening. Which is what's happening. Yeah, which is, that would be incredibly unjust because people have been held back from accumulating wealth based on the actions of the government. Um, and private enterprise and just greedy corruptness in general, rent-seeking behaviors, exactly. self-dealing behaviors, yeah. Yeah. oligopoly like, dynamics. Yeah. So many of these aspects that have been, uh, the one thing that I think you said that I think everyone can um, resonate with is that the society will uh, flourish best when the people that are worst off have the most degrees of economic yes, freedom when yes. they're taken um, as like these are literally our fellow humans that we can help uh, um, maximize their potential and so to, to view it that way I think is one of the best things of versus yeah basically what it seems like at times is that literally moats or walls yeah. are being created that prevent people from um, pursuing things purposely by people that are again self-dealing right. and all these types I of things. I personally lean towards the Rousing approach but I think that I think that there's validity to all of these approaches, yet they all, they all have different starting points, different trade-offs. This is definitely going to be a theme we keep returning to. I love um, this one, this one's yeah, so good. Yeah. And then if we, um, we were trying to get to some things that were um, net a little bit of, you know, we kind of started exploring some of the things that are uh, net good or yeah. net evil. But do you think there's something else that's just coming through humans that is evil that is at play on the planet um like is there is there something evil in the world right now even or? yeah and even potentially beyond the planet that is coming through humans that is performing evil on the planet interesting um i i think that that depends on people's own personal views of like spirituality and good and evil um i i i, I personally would like uh would would uh 
I, 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 I personally don't know my own thinking on this, and probably like if I don't know my own thinking, I'd lean towards evidence. Um, but I think that um, I think that I think that like the problem of evil in the world is like a very very a very uh, a very tough problem to understand. Um, and I think that it's um, it's 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 interesting how like if you think about it, like a society a society with like where everyone cooperated perfectly, where everyone maximized everyone's interests. Like let's say like a utilitarian society where like everyone lived the utilitarianism um, would be a society without, uh, depending on how you define it, without evil, um, without like people harming others, um, let's say, um, if we want to define evil that way. Um, but at the same time, like we have a world where there is clear unnecessary harm. There is like harm from poverty, harm from oppression, harm from things along those lines. Um, uh, and those, those harms that occur don't seem to maximize the good of the world. Like harm through poverty and significant inequality does not seem to maximize the good of not the world. So like yeah. that's where the Rawlsian approach is good of like, of like we should be maximizing the position of the people who are the least well off because that's probably a better world than a world where people are in more extreme poverty, let's say. Yeah. And I, another, I just, another thing that I really like about what, how you take um, certain subject matters is you, like, you kind of know where your worldview is, and then you know that if someone potentially asks you a question that you haven't necessarily thought about like a lot, that then you'll default to saying that, you know, I haven't thought about that enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very humble way that I think more and more people can um, embody um, behaving because our worldview obviously doesn't have answers to everything. So I think that's very important. Socrates famously um, both acknowledged that he knew nothing and also thought that he was the wisest person for that acknowledgement. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. that's, a, that's yeah. a good one. Um, so we were talking a lot about experimentation in um, organizing society, um, mm -hmm. systems of governance across the planet. They're kind of like little permutations that are running across and like we can kind of figure out what the best lines of code are across the US or China or um, certain African philosophies or South American philosophies or wherever around the world. And I think that's a really interesting um, way of viewing it is how mm -hmm. can we potentially make little special economic zones with these different lines of code and mm -hmm. see how they evolve. And I think that's definitely going to be a future of like the little um, pockets that are competing in terms of what um, what places people want to live and um, what are the um, uh, regulations in those areas. I think that's a really good way of putting it. You were actually in a class um, at Stanford um, taught by uh, Peter Thiel and Russell uh, Berman mm -hmm. um, uh, called Sovereignty, Sovereignty and Globalism, um, Globalization. And... Um, I think this is a really interesting point that we were talking about before we started, that nationalism and globalism don't really understand each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so teach us about that. Yeah, so, um, so I'll start with, um, so, so I'll start with how, how, how each side defines their own viewpoint. Um, so nationalism views themselves as like enabling experimentation among different countries. So systems of governance, for example, like the US and China have radically different approaches to governance. Um, we don't know which one's the better approach right now. Um, and it's best to have a world where these countries can try to figure out uh, what, the best way, what the best way to organize the world is. Um, and nationalism sees themselves as like preserving state sovereignty to allow, to allow these experiments to happen. And that's how you really make progress. That's how you discover what the best options are. Um, globalism uh, sees their to be significant downsides from some of those experimentation, from, from some of that experimentation. And it's better to have a universal organizing principle that promotes uh, peace, for example, like how, uh, how a lot of these international institutions preserve peace rather than war. Um, and they see nationalism as, uh, nationalism as something where like, you could lead to societies where they are, like, they're, they're not good for their citizens and like, should we should we should we should we prioritize a system where like countries could do bad things to their populations as well as good things? Um, and I think the issue is that both sides like really really don't both both sides really are kind of talking past each other. That's one takeaway I got from the class. So for example, um, uh, the nationalism believes in preserving state sovereignty. 
Um, and they as long as it's not imperialist, which was as long as it's not imperialist. Yeah, there's a book, The Virtue of Nationalism, that tries to define it as basically nationalism is these is when these countries like uh, have their own experimentation and um, and then that if they are if they try to impose their will on other countries, that's actually not nationalism. That's imperialism, and that would fall more on the uh, on the standpoint of like globalism instead is imposing your will on other countries. Um, this is so interesting thinking about yeah. like tribes that are first evolving on the planet and how mm. they have their own like little kind of like pockets of like nationalistic beliefs as long right. as they don't go and try and conquer other tribal areas um, but rather in like, maybe they can also have a globalized ideology yeah. where they have like free trade between exactly, each other exactly yeah, I like this yeah. yeah and then there's also then there's 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 the globalist approach which is where you say these international institutions are what preserve the peace. They might, like, for example, protect smaller countries that can't defend themselves. And that nationalism, saying that nationalism preserves state sovereignty is incorrect because if a, if a larger country invades a smaller one, like, we should do something about it. We should set up systems to prevent this. So like, I think the key problem is like, what happens when countries don't respect state sovereignty? Yes, yes. Nationalism says uh, that's like, that's that's an imperialist problem. That's that's on the that's on the globalist side, and then globalism says like, actually that's a that's a problem with nationalism. That's because we don't have these international institutions to protect these countries. So they're kind of like, both claiming that the biggest downside is the other the other sides the other sides uh, the yeah. other side is like a responsibility of the other side, yeah. and I think that um, until these like definitional questions get sorted out, we'll just have people talk past each other for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's and the like, nuance unpacked in exactly. a very understandable way. Both, both of them, it's a question of what better preserves state sovereignty, like an international institution with some rules and norms, but that like protects small countries from being invaded, or a system where different countries can experiment. Um, and uh, they believe that these countries experimenting uh, won't lead to invasions of other countries because that's, that's, that's actually an imperialist, act, imperialist action. It's, it's a... It's I think, been a big game of risk up until this point. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. So I think that it's, that's something, that's a very significant divide in society. And it's tough to make progress in these discussions when both sides view the problems as the, as the responsibility of the other side, yeah, not yeah. their side. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's another area where like these are, these are very complicated trade-offs and the responsibility of like, who protects, what protects these smaller states. Correct. Is a really, really uh, it's really, really question. hard, yeah. yeah. I think a, a potentially a good example could be that when you look at um, uh, an, like an indigenous tribe somewhere that is, uh, that someone is trying to colonize that area mm -hmm. where they are, like how can other people from around the world intervene in a way that does not cause a massive war yeah. but that still protects the indigenous tribe yeah so things yeah. like this and i personally I, I i i personally don't take a stance on which one is right in these questions i just think that like we need a better understanding of what even these two sides are saying before we can start to uh understand like which way is a better organizing principle and pressing yeah. reset on civilization and trying to see how the game of risk could have not evolved in a in a imperialistic in a colonized uh in a pillaging and plundering resources and murdering people sort of way is one of my favorite sort of ideas of simulation is mm -hmm. really trying to think back like how could have we evolved in a way that was more harmonious with mm -hmm. nature with each other right yeah these types of and things. each side that harmony is actually the perfect example each side thinks that their approach is more harmonious um, nationalism sees it as all these independent sovereign states that can choose to collaborate how they wish, um, and that they can choose to uh, choose to choose to operate systems of governments uh, governance as they wish. Um, and then the, uh, the 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 globalism standpoint says, like, actually, what's more harmonious is uniting these states together under a system of common rules, um, and that's yeah, yeah. it. it yeah. Preserving the peace under either system is a really, really difficult question, but they both are trying to seek ways for different people to live in harmony. They just have different approaches of how to do it. Yeah. 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 One, definitely one of my favorite parts about our conversation together is just how much you are literally the embodiment of like centrism and nuance. <laughs> like, I love that because I, I, like, I've changed the middle name of 
myself across the platforms to nuance yeah. purposely to try and get more people to think about things in this way. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how cryptocurrency changes governments and the best funding mechanisms yeah. for UBI. Yes, so uh, cryptocurrency changed governments. So there's a great book on this called The Sovereign Individual. Um, it was written, uh, it was written before 2000 and actually predicted all of the cryptocurrency revolution that we see today. Um, the interesting thing about the sovereign revolution, the, the, sorry, the sovereign individual that I think people undervalue with the whole cryptocurrency revolution is the sovereign individual views cryptocurrency as a threat because governments cannot tax it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a threat to the current system of governance because of that, because it's, it's, it's money that can be moved easily, in some cases moved untraceably, yes. and that acts as a direct, uh, direct threat to the current, the current systems that we have. Mm -hmm. um, the sovereign individual believes that this will, the, the book believes that this will lead to uh, governments essentially competing for winning over citizens of like we, and this, this kind of ties into our nationalism and globalism discussion from earlier, like it, they believe that governments will like put forward different incentives to start different industries or to get people to move there and that governments will serve their citizens best if they have this like basically like competition for citizenry between each other. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, but on the other hand, like if there's the power, if, if governments lose the power to tax, that could also lead to um, like more, like, like more oppression or like the banning of these technologies um, in an attempt to preserve the status quo. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, I think this also uh, works really interestingly in terms of like special economic zones, which I am fascinated by but have not read deeply on. So uh, this is this is this is just my my off the cuff thoughts on this. Is that like special economic zones are essentially a way to say like, hey, we think that this system might be an interesting system to try. Yep. We're going to put it out there. People can choose to participate in it or not. Yep. Um, and it's it's interesting how. Uh, how, how the US does not really pursue this. I mean, the federalist system of like allowing states to put forward different regulations and policies is one way to do it. China has the approach of special economic zones for specific cities. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting how there's, there's the question of like, how much leeway do you give on a local level and how much do you preserve at a federal level? Um, and different countries have different approaches, but I think this experimentation is important and I think that this experimentation of testing different methods of how to live is not is not done enough especially in the United States it seems like cryptocurrency and decentralization technologies are coming in as the exact um, contrast or antithesis uh, to what happened um, with setting up like the Federal Reserve and mm -hmm. um, things like that and uh, having fiat currency circulate around the world and these types of things so you're right, though, on tax on taxation. You know, how does a how does a country um, figure out how to um, how to do that um, mm -hmm. and support its construction of uh, roads and um, uh, police stations, fire stations, mm -hmm. all these types of different hospitals, all these types of schools. There's so so it's actually um, uh, difficult to figure out. But could there potentially be a way to figure out how to um, yeah. how to do that? I think uh, with the addition of cryptocurrencies, I think that would be fantastic let's go to UBI best funding mechanisms for UBI which ones are even politically feasible yes yeah so there's there's a bunch of different ideas for funding UBI um, and I think they all have their they they there, there's one I personally am in favor of um, but there's some catches to it that I'll get to so the first approach is like let's tax let's tax labors so like let's tax people's work and we'll use that directly to fund a UBI um, that in the case of massive job loss leads to reciprocity concerns. So the concern is like, will the people who are working be opposed to a UBI because they feel like they're working and other people aren't and that their money is being taken from them and given to others? Um, there's, there's concerns around taxing, taxing, taxing labor in that way um, because of questions that people have of fairness. Um, and then of course there's the flip side of fairness of like, if someone, if there's so much job loss that some people are just unable to find jobs at all, is it fair to have the people who are still working like think that they are entitled to more when some people, again, just based on the luck of like how they happen to be born into certain circumstances or the skills that they happen to learn um, that like became irrelevant, uh, should, they, should they be punished for those when in another scenario they easily could have ended up being perfectly okay? Um, then there's the other approach of like, do we tax capital, do we tax do we tax companies directly? Um, 
And I mean, that, that has similar trade-offs towards taxing labor. The third approach that is under-discussed in the UBI literature, but one that is really, really interesting to me, is um, instead uh, creating a uh, citizen's dividend or social dividend. Um, this is done, for example, in Alaska. Alaska, uh, based, on their based on the revenues that they received from their oil resources, have invested those and then give every person, I think, $2,000 a year. Um, the Eastern Band of Cherokees uh, has a casino that is able, that, that generates enough revenue to give every member um, of the tribe $9,000, uh, I think, I think $9,000 per year, which gets pretty close to Andrew Yang's proposal of $12,000 per year. Um, I think another approach that we could take to funding universal basic income is to start investing this money now um, from, say, like investing in companies that are t in the technology industry or uh, investing in things that, investing in industries that we think might grow if automation occurs, um, and then using the profits from those investments to distribute it back to the citizens. So the idea is like, let's tax everyone now while Every, while, while many people have jobs, put that money away for a while, and then when there's massive job loss, we pay it out based on the investments that the government has made. Um, there's ways to do this in ways that preserve free markets. Um, this is, interestingly enough, this is both a, uh, both, this could be taken as both a libertarian idea and a socialist idea. Um, the socialists say you're buying stakes in companies on behalf of the government to give citizen shares in them. The libertarians say, it's a, the best way to avoid taxation and to preserve people's choice, um, and it's the best way to preserve the free market. It's, it's interesting. The implementation matters a lot in, 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 in basically like which view you take on. But uh, this is my own personal take on the best way to fund UBI. This is not as discussed in the literature as the other options, but of course the catch is that it raises a lot less money than the other options. Um, so that's the real trade-off. It's like this thing that sounds like everyone wins, like, let's tax everyone now, let's put the money away for a while, let's distribute it when things are, when people are worse off. You might not have that much money to distribute and you might need to lean on other funding sources as well. Um, people need meaningful endeavoring every single day when they wake up too. That's a massive yes, part of this. That's, that's, and that's another debate in when it comes to automation is some people think that automation will, automation plus universal basic income will free people up to pursue like this Rawlsian conception of their own version of the good life. Like you can wake up every day and make art or volunteer or do whatever else you want. And then other people are like, the work and the paid work is what provides dignity and meaning. Mm -hmm. When you lose that, um, you, 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 you lead to people like, you know, the classic examples are like, what if people use it to buy drugs or what if people like sit on the couch all day and play video games? Um, studies show that that tends to not happen. Um, but um, there's, there's this approach of, does job loss enable freedom or does it uh, harm people's freedom and dignity? Um, and that you can see that directly in the current proposals. Um, some, some proposals that uh, Congress is talking about, and these are all more like, or these are all more discussions right now, nothing close to being law, is let's give people jobs and say infrastructure, uh, similar to what we did on the New Deal, like let's, let's have people focused on, focused on specifically like Let's, let's focus on offering work if people want it. And then the other approach is like, why force people into work when they could be doing other things? Things that are difficult to value, like if someone's taking care of their children or taking care of their parents, we can't really put a dollar amount on that easily, but we can say that it's a valuable thing to do. Mm -hmm. So why don't we help people make decisions on what they personally value? And that is hopefully mm -hmm. more meaningful than the idea of paid work. Um, it's yeah. a complicated future with yes. distribution of figuring out how to do wealth inequality, figuring out what cryptocurrency has to do with this. Um, yeah. yeah, Figuring out how automation is going to play out into this picture. Yeah. Um, cryptocurrency is an interesting one. And I never made this connection before, but if you, if, you, if you do believe that cryptocurrency will harm the government's ability to tax, and you also believe that funding UBI requires some substantial increase in taxation, if those two things conflict, that's, it's, a, it's, it, we're talking about two unlikely scenarios um, in a future where like cryptocurrency is dominant and harms taxation and then also where there's massive job loss and automation, mm -hmm. but it's not impossible. And I think what happens then, no one, as far as I know, there's not any literature on this. No one's really thought about that. But if anyone watching is interested in what, how do we, how do we, 
how do we fund a UBI when we can't tax people and there's also massive job loss? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's, that's a scenario that could play out. Yeah, tendencies to maybe want to, uh, to give into the um, helping people that uh, increase their degrees of freedom. There's all different types of potentially yeah. Yeah, solutions. Yeah. Um, how about, are we in a simulation? Yes, uh, are we in a simulation? Uh, that yes was yes to like, that's a great question. Not, uh, I don't, I don't, I, I personally think that like, I don't know what the likelihood of if we're in a simulation or if we not, or if we're not is, but I do think that there's really interesting questions related to this. So I, I, I agree with Bostrom that like, it's possible that, that, you know, that three scenarios are possible. One is that society will never advance to the point where, the, where, where a simulation of a universe is possible. Another is that it will advance that point and we're the first society to do so. And another is that another society has already advanced that point and, um, and we are in a simulation because they, they were first and we weren't. Um, I, don't, I don't know which one's most likely, but I think there's a really interesting underexplored implication of the third option um, that, like, that another society advanced this point first and we're in the simulation. Um, and, so Bostrom presents a few reasons for why we might be living in a simulation, why, why society might like, bother to simulate us. It seems like a rather difficult project to undertake. Um, one, one, one potential he gives is like, that the society values human life and like, values the idea of like, more human life existing being better. But I think that that's a tough one because like, then why is there death and why is there evil and why is there suffering? If the value is human life, like, why aren't we all living in the Garden of Eden? Like, perfectly blissful, perfectly happy, perfectly ignorant. Like, why do we have the like, somewhat like, like broken world that we have right now? Um, so if, we, if, if the simulation exists because we value human life, I think there's unanswered questions about the problem of evil. And Bostrom like kind of, he, he, he addresses these, but I don't think the answer is totally satisfying. Like he says like, well, maybe the idea of pain itself is simulated. But he has this really fun, really, really, really amusing aside where he says like, and this is not much consolation to the people who are currently experiencing pain. So like, it's easy to say like, maybe there's not actually suffering because the, the pain itself is not something people are having. But like, if you have the conscious experience of pain as everyone does, then like, it's tough to take that stance. Um, and Bostrom kind of leaves that unanswered. The second approach is like, maybe they want to learn something from us being in a simulation. Maybe, maybe they're experimenting totally. with systems of governance, ways to organize society, what happens if you have these ideas. Yep. And in my mind, there's two scenarios there. One is that the, it's dependent on us not knowing we're in a simulation, which could explain like, why it would be impossible to discover this fact. Um, Bostrom talks about how the system can create the appearance of consistency by, for example, when you look under a microscope, it bothers to like, simulate all of the organisms inside, but when you just stare at a glass of tap water, you it, it's not bothering to simulate it to reduce processing power that yeah. it requires. Um, so if, we, if, we're, if we're in a simulation that depends on us not knowing that we're in a simulation, why would, be, why would we be allowed to think of the idea of a simulation in the first place? So if we're supposed to be ignorant of this fact, why can we think of it at all? That's um, what makes the game fun. Exactly, and if we and and then if it depends on us, or if it if it's neutral to us realizing we're in a simulation, then why haven't we been able to figure it out yet? Um, it's or, hard to probe. Exactly. At the simulation. Yeah. yeah. So either it's trying to deceive us, in which case it seems easier to just never allow people to think of this idea in the first place, or it's not trying to deceive us, and in which case it's unclear why we don't have answers yet, unless the answer is like we need our research methodologies to develop more. We ourselves are an experiment and we ourselves will be creating experiments and then it will be more potentially easier for us to realize that how we're already in one as we make our yeah, own yeah. type thing. Oh, well, why wouldn't you just make it the Garden of Eden? Well, that's not fun. We need to add the good and the evil to it. And that's what makes them in the simulation have more. Right. And that's so what we're in. Yeah. Maybe the answer is the simulation is trying to learn something from us, if we are in a simulation, um, in which case the question is, what would they be trying to learn? They which would be in many ways one. trying to learn, uh, I think, how a civilization evolves, yeah. uh, how civilizations evolve around. This is a very fun one, these little planets around stars, like this yeah. little universe design. Then there's other ideas of universe design where different creatures could evolve mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, 
And then last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Yeah, I think that it's still staggering to me like how much of our the world around us is actually imagined um, like based on these like collective collective fictions like all of philosophy is fundamentally imagined like it's imagined based on certain starting points and certain axioms and then beyond that it's like you're talking about entire ways to organize how people live based on these abstract ideas that like there's no there's no there's no physical instantiation of utilitarianism. It's just this idea that exists. There's no like uh, Rawls thinking up, thinking Rawls thinking up the ideas that he did has a dramatic influence on like actually like whether people are happy, whether people are suffering. Um, I think the ability to come up with these concepts that like don't exist at all in any physical form, yet still influence the physical world are like something that. These imagined realities are still kind of kind of staggering to me. Of like, someone thought up the idea of the nation, so now we have nations. Um, there's no re reason. There's borders, for example, or like borders or races or things like that. There's like, it is they exist because of the categories and things along those lines that we've defined. Um, and uh, you could define different categories. You could define no categories at all. I think people on different sides of the political spectrum take very different approaches to like whether these categories exist, how they should be defined. But it's interesting to me just like the most the most beautiful thing is that like we've constructed a world well beyond what just physically exists around us. And I don't think we acknowledge that enough. And that's why if, if I if I wanted to call the action for why study philosophy, um, the reason to study philosophy is because a lot of these questions of how we should live our lives, how society should be structured, like whether what is good and evil, they're things that we will never be able to find in the physical world. I mean, some people have the idea mm -hmm. of like maybe with a perfect understanding of human mm -hmm. brain, we'll have like a, a, mm -hmm. a, the human brain will have a scientific idea of happiness, stuff like that. But I I think like that these questions really come down to like how we imagine the world to be, what first principles we take on, and yeah. how it should. How, how we should move forward based on that. Yep. And philosophy is one of the only tools we have to, to explore that. Um, I think that there is, because so much of our world is socially constructed, there's limits to what science can tell us. And philosophy is helpful for probing those limits and understanding what we take for granted and what we don't. And that's what you think is the most beautiful. The fact, that, the fact that we have imagined these structures that exist that allow us to cooperate but then also that we have tools in place to shape and probe these systems. And you can change, for example, like utilitarianism can change the world purely based on the idea of how we should live. If, if people adopt this idea of maximizing net good, um, whether or not that's the best approach to live is unclear and also a role of philosophy. But let's say people adopt this approach of maximizing net good and they, they take that on. You've changed dramatically people's lives based purely on an idea that Jeremy Bentham thought up um, a few hundred years yeah. ago. Yeah. That's, that's, that's staggering. And yes. 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 Our philo is, is philosophy the path to the most influential career? I think there's a small number of philosophers who are extremely influential. Um, Peter Singer, Jeremy Bentham, uh, Kant, um, the Greek philosophers, um, Rawls. Then there's a lot of philosophers who are not influential at all, but I think if you if you if you if you want if you want a low probability but extremely high impact potential path in life, thinking about these ideas and studying them either formally or informally is a very good way to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Really appreciate yeah, it's it. It's been fantastic. Absolutely. I'm glad you've had a good time. We've oh, had a yeah. great time as well. It's been super fun unpacking mm -hmm. all these subjects with you. Huge shout out to everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you think about everything from privacy, centrism and nuance, organizing society, all of the different things that we talked about, cryptocurrencies, UBI, simulation, mm -hmm. hypothesis, so much of the good stuff. Just let us know your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Also, talk to more people, your friends, families, coworkers, people online on social media about these subjects. Get talking about them more. Have that nuance centric mm -hmm. discourse about it, not polarized discourse about it. Shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing the show. We greatly appreciate it, Ron. And also support 
the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the scientists around the world that you believe in, support them, help them grow. Check out Will's links below. Also check out Simulations, links below. Support us, Patreon, PayPal, cryptocurrency, all our links are below. Design cool merch and get paid for it. That link is below as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. Peace.